<laughs> Scientists love to do experiments. We love to do experiments because one of the best ways to learn about how nature works is to manipulate part of it and then observe the response of the rest of the system. Experiments can be done at all different scales. There can be very small-scaled, focused and controlled experiments, such as being done in this slide. You can also imagine experiments at a larger scale, at the whole ecosystem scale, such as been done on a number of lakes around the world. One could even imagine an experiment at the global scale, though that would be a bit crazy because it would all be subjects in our own experiment. Well, actually, we're already doing it. Maybe not intentionally, but through the combustion of fossil fuels and tropical deforestation, human activities are putting about 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year. Not surprisingly, when you put 35 billion tons of a heat-trapping gas into the atmosphere, the Earth warms up, and other changes occur as well. Most of my research is in the Arctic, and the Arctic's sort of at the center of the climate change issue for a number of reasons. First, warming's greatest in the Arctic, about two or three times greater than the global average. The Arctic's also particularly sensitive to warming, so even a little bit of warming can cause big changes in Arctic ecosystems. And third, and probably most important, frozen soils in the Arctic, what we call permafrost, contain vast quantities of ancient organic carbon that built up over thousands and thousands of years. And as the Earth warms and the Arctic warms, the permafrost thaws and some of that ancient carbon can decompose, producing greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, and methane, which can cause more warming, more permafrost thaw, more release of greenhouse gases, and that's what we call a positive feedback loop. Just to put it in perspective, the Arctic has about twice as much carbon locked up in permafrost as is currently in the atmosphere, or three to four times as much carbon as is in all vegetation globally. So there are vast amounts of carbon in there. And we can ask the question, is there anything we can do in the Arctic to try to keep that carbon in the ground as the Earth warms? The conventional answer to that question is no. Global warming is being driven from processes outside of the Arctic, tropical deforestation, fossil fuel combustion. There's nothing we can do in the Arctic to help put the brakes on. But if we're willing to step outside of the box, to think outside of the box, I think the answer is maybe. And it's that maybe that I'd like to explore for the rest of this presentation. The ideas that I'll share originate largely with this remarkable Russian scientist, Sergei Zimov. I've had the privilege of working with him for a number of years on several projects. Uh, he's the director of the Northeast Science Station near Chersky, Siberia. He's lived there year-round for the past 30 years, right up near the Arctic Ocean in the northeast corner of Siberia. To introduce this idea, I want to step back in time a little bit to the Pleistocene period, which began almost 2 million years ago and extended until about 12,000 years ago. During the Pleistocene, the soils of the region were slowly but steadily accumulating organic carbon, pulling it out of the atmosphere for the growth of plants. The plants would die, they wouldn't fully decompose, and that carbon would build up in the, in the soils of that time. Then about 12,000 years ago, something happened. Most of the big animals went extinct quite rapidly. Those that didn't go extinct, things like muskox and reindeer uh, and, and moose, their populations also plunged. And it seems that humans were involved in this extinction. Humans had recently moved into the areas, their populations were growing, their hunting technologies were improving to the extent that they could wipe out most of the big animals. Soon after that extinction event occurred, this vast grassland, it was actually during the Pleistocene, the, the largest ecosystem on Earth was this mammoth steppe ecosystem. But as soon as the big animals went extinct, this vast grassland converted to Earth's largest forest, the boreal forest, which is still there now. And we can ask the question, what might be the implication of this transition from grassland to forest on the fate of the carbon, which is locked up in the permafrost? To introduce that concept, or to think about that concept, I want to I introduce two ideas. The first relates to the, 
amount of the incoming sunlight that is absorbed by the land surface versus being reflected back to the atmosphere. So if you picture a vast grassland in the Arctic for maybe nine months per year, that would be covered in snow. Snow being white is a very reflective surface, so the sunlight that comes in, the vast majority of it just reflects right back out through the atmosphere without causing any warming. Now if you think of the boreal forest, those trees in the background, this dark color absorbs much more of the incoming solar radiation and only a relatively little amount reflects back out. So a conversion from, from grassland to boreal forest is going to cause more of the incoming solar radiation to be absorbed and cause warming and cause the permafrost to warm. Another factor that I'd like to consider invo also involves snow and the insulating capacity of snow. It turns out that snow is a fantastic insulator, so you can have frigid air temperatures in the Arctic in the winter, minus 40, minus 50 degrees Celsius, but beneath a deep snowpack, the ground temperatures might be only minus 10 degrees Celsius. But during the Pleistocene, when we had these vast herds of large animals, uh, they would trample the snow, and when you trample the snow, that greatly diminishes its capacity to insulate. So the cold air temperatures in the winter could propagate down into the ground, keeping the permafrost colder. So if this is all right, and humans came along and led to the extinction of the big animals, and that led to the um, conversion of grassland to forest, which causes warming of the ground, then maybe restoring mega herbivores to the Siberian Arctic might just help keep the permafrost cold in the future and keep that carbon in the ground. It's actually not just an idea, but several years ago, Sergei Zimov started an experiment which he's dubbed Pleistocene Park. This is up in the northeast corner of Siberia. This uh, yellow area, is, it's a fence that encloses a, a region of about 44,000 acres. In the next few years, he hopes to enclose a larger region of about 40,000 acres. And several years ago, he began increasing the abundance of some of the animals that are still in the region, things like these wild horses, moose, reindeer, uh, to try to get it closer to the, uh, the abundance of animals that were present during the Pleistocene period. Uh, he's sort of uh, sped up the efforts recently, just in the last year, he's reintroduced animals that haven't been in this part of the Siberian Arctic for many thousands of years. Bison, musk ox, and elk. Now I said earlier that this ecosystem is called the mammoth steppe ecosystem. The namesake animal, of course, is the woolly mammoth. The last woolly mammoth died off around 4,000 years ago. But I'll mention in passing that there is a Japanese scientist who claims that within the next five years, he'll have cloned a woolly mammoth from cells found frozen in permafrost. <laughs> we'll see. <clears throat> the work that I'm most directly involved in now is trying to figure out if this experiment is actually working. So we're putting temperature sensors in the ground throughout Pleistocene Park and also outside of the boundaries of Pleistocene Park in forested areas and grassland areas and trying to see if the ground temperatures are actually closer or colder in the grassland areas and where there are large animals present. Am I suggesting that this might actually be a solution to global climate change? Absolutely not. The only thing that I know of that can actually do that is to dramatically decrease the 35 billion tons of carbon dioxide that we're putting into the atmosphere each year. But I am suggesting that the reintroduction of mega herbivores to the Siberian Arctic might just help keep the ground colder, thus help keep that, that vast amount of organic carbon locked up in the permafrost and out of the atmosphere. And given the potential implications of global climate change for all of us, and particularly for future generations, I for one am very excited to explore this and other crazy ideas. Thank you.